All right, we are live for something that I haven't done for quite a while, namely uh, philosophy pop-ups, which are kind of impromptu chats that I have with my viewers and subscribers. Usually I give Patreon uh, members, the supporters of the work that I do, a little bit of lead time, but today I decided to do this kind of out of the blue. So while we're waiting for uh, people to pop in, I'll uh, give you a really brief rundown on what I'm doing in this one. So I taught for Marquette University last semester three sections of classes. One was a class that I'd taught several times before, which they call Foundations of Philosophy. And is really just sort of a glorified introduction to philosophy course with a couple extra bells and whistles mandated by committees, you could say. The other was a new upper level core class, mainly for seniors. It's a required class and it's called um, Service of Faith and Promotion of Justice, which, you know, sounds like a kind of preachy class, but, you know, kind of also fits the bill for a university that is at least still nominally Catholic and Jesuit, which Marquette University is. And we could have a whole other conversation about Marquette's identity and what's happened in Catholic education, because if you look at the decision making that happens at Marquette, it's not only not directed by any sort of uh, real religious values, but actually in, in contradiction to them much of the time. Uh, and it's been that way for a long time. Anyway, so this is this is a class that's supposed to be like a capstone and, you know, make students think about some big, big topic, some big issue. And different people, you know, set different uh, problems that they work with. So some people like focus on debt or homelessness or, you know, I actually considered focusing on food insecurity. Um, I've seen some of my colleagues do things like faith and reason, where it's not really a social issue so much and much more a, a metaphysical or epistemological issue. And I was talking with my wife about the idea of doing food stuff. And then suddenly I realized, well, hell, I do all this work on anger and philosophy, both in sort of a theoretical and also practical way. It's a huge problem in our society. It's gotten worse, you could say, in the last couple decades. And philosophy, as it turns out, has a lot to contribute to, to adequately understanding this, this difficult emotion, going way, way back into ancient philosophy in the West. And so why don't I make that my topic? And so that's what I did last semester with two sections of that class. I drew on resources that I already had. I, you know, developed new resources. You may have seen some of the uh, videos and podcasts on, you know, people like, say, Plutarch or uh, John um, uh, Chrysostom or, you know, some some other, well, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, um, Seneca. So I, I, uh, I thought it was kind of a cool thing to do. And then, uh, as is typically the case, if you're an adjunct at Marquette, they leave you kind of high and dry and don't even say goodbye. Your semester is over. And, and that's it. And so I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll just, you know, work on my other stuff because I'm a busy guy and I'll keep teaching at Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design rather than at Marquette just down the road over there. Um, well, anyway, last Tuesday, the assistant chair of the department emailed me and he said, hey, is there any way that you can take on a section on Tuesdays and Thursdays of this upper level core class. Um, so that's a week before classes start. And I thought about it and I was like, well, do I want to do this again? You know, um, got to show up there and I got all this other stuff to do, but it's also like guaranteed money. And I do like teaching students face to face. And, you know, I've, I've already taught the class so I could take what I've got and, you know, improve it a little bit. And it wouldn't be like starting a whole new class from the ground up like I did last semester. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. 
And uh, long story short, I'm in the system now and I'm going to be teaching the class. So I thought, um, you know, I would uh, do a little talk about that, what we're going to cover in the class, the whole point of the class and that sort of business. And then you could ask whatever questions you want to. I know people are interested in the classes that I teach. People have been asking about the reading list. So maybe that's the place to start. I've, uh, I've got a textbook for the class, which uh, I don't have the cover on because I, I don't like book covers, but you can see it right here. Martha Nussbaum's Anger and Forgiveness, although I'm seeing it kind of reversed in this. Um, and it's, it's not a it's not a bad book. It's actually, I would say, decent to good. It's not great. I'm actually going to do a review of this book and some of its weaknesses and, you know, uh, idiosyncrasies, but it, it works for the students. It's, you know, quite readable. Um, Nussbaum uses plenty of examples, invokes a lot of the people that are, you know, important to read when it comes to anger, at least in, in Western philosophy. And she's thinking about the larger social context that we're in. So it is a matter of anger and justice. It's actually subtitled Resentment, Generosity, Justice. And those are things that she comes back to over and over again. So we're using this book. And then what else are we reading? So I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. Um, we are, oh, this is the wrong one. Let me pull up the, the one for this semester. Here we go. Um, we're starting off with Audre Lorde's piece, The Uses of Anger, which is uh, quite good and um, well worth reading. And it kind of situates the, the discussion. You know, Lorde thinks that anger is important to use, to harness. Um, and Nussbaum is going to take a position that's a bit more suspicious of anger in working for justice, in trying to change things for the better. Then we're reading uh, some, some of Eschelus, the Eumenides, um, looking at uh, that because Nussbaum brings it up. And then we jump right into Aristotle, and we look at Rhetoric Book One's discussion of anger, which is very, very important. Aristotle is one of the first people to really analyze how anger works, what it is, what causes it. He doesn't, you know, necessarily define everything perfectly, but he really does a lot of important work that sets the agenda. Then we're reading somebody who you're probably less familiar with. I mean, everybody's heard of Aristotle. There's this guy, Joseph Butler, and he's, you know, he's kind of an important early modern uh, theologian and philosopher. Um, and we're reading two of his sermons that have to do specifically with anger and forgiveness. And I really like his uh, discussions. They're, they're great for setting the agenda. Then we're going to read some Martin Luther King. We're going to read this uh, piece, Unfulfilled Hopes. Um, then we jump into Lactantius. Lactantius was a, a very important early church father, a Latin writer, and he's got a treatise called On the Anger of God where he says God does, in fact, get angry at us. Not quite in the same way that we do, but he has to feel anger uh, because it's connected to God's goodness. And he takes on the Stoics and the Epicureans and, to a lesser extent, the other philosophical schools of his, his time. Uh, then we're going to read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Book 4, Discussion of Anger and Virtues and Vices, um, then we look at John Chrysostom. He has uh, two homilies that are particularly important, one on uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, one on the uh, Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at Augustine of Hippo after that, some sermons, some letters, some discussions of anger. Um, we'll also be looking at some, some texts from you know, the Gospels and Paul's letters and from uh, earlier Hebrew writings, particularly the wisdom literature and, and some of the narratives 
uh, talking about that. Then we'll be reading the entirety of Seneca's book on anger, which is a classic in discussions of anger. So we're reading through the whole thing. Nussbaum kind of agrees with Seneca on some things, kind of disagrees. So it's a nice counterposition. Um, we'll be reading Euripides' Medea, talking about her, one of the classic figures of anger in the ancient world. Then we're going to look at the Stoic philosopher Epictetus and what he says about Medea and other things having to do with anger in the discourses. Uh, we'll be looking at Thomas Aquinas's discussions of anger in the Summa Theologiae, uh, looking at some, some uh, bits of Marcus Aurelius's meditations where he talks about anger, um, looking at uh, Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he discusses anger. You may only associate Smith with, you know, The Wealth of Nations, but he wrote another big book that's just as important called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And then we're going to backtrack a bit and read some, some Plato, looking at the Euthyphro and the Gorgias and the discussions of anger there. We'll look at some uh, Jeremy Bentham, the great utilitarian philosopher, and his uh, principles of morals and legislation. And then we finish up by reading Plutarch's little work on controlling anger. And we finish the semester by looking at John Cassian's Institutes Book 8 and Gregory's Morale on Job, where they're talking about anger or wrath as one of the seven deadly sins or the eight capital vices. So a good bit of reading. And every week during the class, they generally, except when we're just reading Seneca or just reading Plutarch, they're reading a little bit of the Nussbaum book, you know, maybe 10 pages or so, five to 10 pages. And then they're reading one of these other selections. And in my classes, we do a lot of discussion. I do some lecturing, but my lecture style is to, you know, ask questions, ask them to provide examples, take ideas and put them up on the board and then, you know, examine them back and forth. So my, my lecture style is, you know, trying to engage the, the students. And I might incorporate some exercises for class this time around. We'll, we'll see what happens, you know. Um, I, I'm throwing this together at the last minute. I hadn't been planning on actually doing this, and I've got, well, three days before I got to walk in front of these students with a pretty much fully baked course in mind. I am going to be adding some some resources that you'll see. You know, I'm uh, there's videos that I need to shoot on some of these thinkers and podcast episodes uh, that go along with them. I provide them with uh, lesson pages when I can, or also with um, handouts that I develop for my classes. Um, and uh, you know, every week they have work to do. But it's not a particularly tough class that way. They have a quiz that I let them take as many times as they want. Um, I'm mainly interested. It's, it's sort of low-level stuff. I'm mainly interested in seeing them, you know, get it stuck in their head and get it right. And then there's a discussion forum that they engage in each week that's a little bit more substantive work on their part, and they have to engage each other. So we've got that nice um, way of connecting up with their classmates outside of class and, and, you know, working through the text. And then the other things that they do, the two main projects for the class, one is at the beginning, they, they do kind of a self-assessment of where they are in terms of anger. And they kind of keep track of that along the way. And then at the end of the semester, they do another self-assessment and, you know, think about what progress they've made personally in terms of anger, who was useful for them, uh, what practices or ideas they managed to successfully apply. And then the other thing is sort of an integrative project that is connected with their, their major, you know. And, um, you know, the majors for this class at Marquette could be everything from supply chain management to theater to, you know, education to nursing to you, you pick it. And there's guaranteed to be somebody in my class that's that's from 
that. Um, so, you know, it's very rare too that I get a philosophy student. I did have one philosophy student in my class last semester, but usually it's it's people from other disciplines. And I, I like that, you know, because that shows you that philosophy is valuable. The fact that you can apply it as a non-expert in other fields, right? So it's easy to teach philosophy students, let alone philosophy graduate students. It's much tougher to teach a philosophy class to non-majors, especially non-majors who are like, why the hell do I have to take this damn core class, right? So I try to make it as interesting for my students as possible. Um, you know, a lot of them write me after the semester's over and they're like, oh, I got a lot out of this. You know, I, I'm happy with this. Um, I can take some of these things and apply them in, in real life. And so I think that that's really quite, quite good. So that is what I'm doing for this class. I've given you the readings. I've given you the, you know, sort of general approach that I take. Um, you know, the, the means of assessment, as we call them in the education industry, meaning the types of activities and assignments that they get graded on. So now, um, you know, I'll just take questions on, on this and related topics. And, uh, you know, if we don't use up the whole hour that I carved out, that's a-okay. I got class work to do and other things to do. But if you do have questions or comments, I'm happy to, you know, answer them or respond to them. So Marco actually says, I wish I could take this class. It sounds very interesting. So I, I'm not going to take this class as such and simply put it into, um, you know, a not for credit personal enrichment class um, in part because, you know, when we're doing online classes that are not in a college setting, we have a lot more flexibility. With this class, I get, you know, essentially at, with, with breaks and stuff, 14 weeks to work with, and everything has to be crammed into that. So I think I probably will develop some smaller classes that have to do with philosophers and theologians discussing anger in my study with Sadler Teachable Academy that I, that I have, um, where, you know, I've got my Aristotle class and uh, philosophical worldviews and values and uh, the Epictetus class, and I'll be bringing out some other additional classes. So I think I'll, I'll probably um, do that in, in the, the future. Um, but it won't be for credit. It, it'll be, it'll be, you know, for other things, but it, it'll, it'll provide people with an opportunity. And, you know, this is uh, along different lines. I've actually been thinking, so years and years ago, some of you may have seen these videos. Um, I did a lecture series, lecture and discussion, uh, for the Kingston Public Library called Understanding Anger. And I did, I was supposed to do a whole year, but then we moved back here to Milwaukee, right? So I, we left New York, we came here and I finished up with uh, the ninth or 10th lecture. I want to say the ninth, the 10th, um, cause we did leave in October. And uh, so I didn't get through, through the whole sequence and I never really, you know, with a year you can't cover everything you'd like to cover. But I've been thinking about, um, resuscitating that, that series as something that I do like this, you know, with uh, me giving kind of a presentation and um, people asking questions and putting some readings up there ahead of time. And just like, you know, it wouldn't just be over the course of a year, maybe it'd be over the course of a couple of years. And we could zero in on some thinkers at greater length, you know, like we wouldn't cram all the Stoics into one single session, um, you know, or, or we could come back to Aristotle or we could we could do a lot more literature as well, which I think is quite important and interesting. So there's, you know, there's some possibilities. Jacob says would love to attend this class or really any classes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be... Um, there goes the dryer. It's going to be a decent class. Um, I mean, 
this is one of the things that that kind of sucks, right? You'd have to be enrolled in Marquette and be here in Milwaukee and show up twice a week to it. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of things that that get in the way of that. And you might actually like some of the other classes that I'm teaching. Like I'm teaching a philosophy as a way of life class for Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. That one's online and asynchronous. But again, you'd have to be like enrolled as a MyEd student. But I'm, I'm looking to how I can, you know, do some of these things, not the entire class necessarily, but at least some of these things for learners all over the world who, who do want to participate in, in this sort of stuff. So you know, you want to like check, um, social media and, uh, I'm going to be starting, you know, years ago, we started a mailing list that I haven't been using, uh, email list. Uh, and I'll start doing that, uh, some updates in that as well. So, all right. Uh, Jason says, which topic in philosophy do you think is most interesting? I don't have, you know, a lot of times when people ask me like most best, favorite. I don't really have answers to that. I'm kind of um, spread out over a number of things. I mean, the topic of anger, obviously, I'm very interested in, been studying it and contributing to philosophical understanding of it for over two decades. Um, there's all sorts of like little projects that I've had here and there that I call philosophical detective work where I'm reading somebody. I'm like, this is a really interesting topic. Um, the issue of the will and how we shape our character, that's really central to me. And I do collaborative work with uh, my friend Harold Kavli on that. I mean, obviously, uh, philosophy and heavy metal, you know, uh, and I've got a collaborator for that. Actually, more than one, Ken Blackwell has, has been to uh, our classic metal classes and made some really significant contributions of his own to that when Scott Truly and I do that. So I, I don't really have a favorite topic in philosophy. I, you know, that's kind of a detriment, right? Because I, I, I'm not hyper specialized, uh, which means that I'm always kind of playing catch up. Right? Um, so Ken says, I've not read the suggested course book, but reading the synopsis, it sounds quite interesting. Definitely see parallels with some stoic ideas of anger. Yeah, so I should say a little bit about Nussbaum. So why why do I, do I go with this? Is it just because she's a big famous name? Actually, that's one of the things I kind of dislike about Nussbaum. She's one of those people who is sort of like Norman Mailer. Norman Mailer said that he had an imperialistic ambition to like, you know, dominate every genre of literature. And Nussbaum is kind of like that. There's not an area that Nussbaum won't try to, to move into, right? Uh, and, and talk something about. And she's generally pretty good, but she's not outstanding, I would say, compared to some of the other great authors of our time, like, say, Julia Annas or Nancy Sherman or Alistair McIntyre, who are covering similar, similar areas, you know. Um, but it's a good book because she is framing things in terms of, you know, these perennial, well, what is anger? How does it work? Um, should we rely upon it or not? She comes up with her own new concept that she calls the transition or transition anger, which is worth exploring. I'll probably do some videos about that over the course of the semester. Um, and, you know, she does steer it in interesting ways. She's a little bit too focused on law, I would say, when it comes to thinking about social matters. Um, but that's because she's, she's also a law professor. So, you know, that's, there aren't any perfect books. All right, um, BG, I attend a secret underground class in the basement of a bar regarding anger, but the rules dictate I'm not allowed to talk about it. Well, you already broke the rule right there, right? Um, so probably a reference to Fight Club there. Uh, German Cortez, what reasons does Nussbaum have to be skeptical about the usefulness of anger in relation to justice? Do you agree with them? I'm, I'm, so let's position it like this. You've got all these thinkers that take anger seriously as a moral and political um, phenomenon. 
And they range the gamut from the Stoics, some Christian authors who are like, zero, let's call it zero tolerance. Anger is never good. So Seneca's in there. Uh, John Cassian is in there, right? And then you've got like Aristotle. And Aristotle gets presented by Seneca as if like he's like pro-anger. And Aristotle's not. He does think that you, you do need, there is such a thing as virtuous anger but watch out because what you think is virtuous anger in yourself probably isn't, right? So there's, there, if we have a spectrum here, most of the readers that we're reading, with the, the other end of the spectrum being it, like, get angry all the time. It's good for you, you know? Don't let anyone push you around. They're all from, like, this middle position on, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the other extreme. And Nussbaum would be kind of in here. She She's... You know, she doesn't want to go as far as the Stoics. She's also very suspicious of any uh, religious orientation towards this. So she's kind of a nice foil in this respect. And she tends to think that um, anger, anger can be useful for getting things started, for directing our attention but then we need to transition it into something that's either a different kind of anger or not anger at all. Um, and this is what she calls the transition. And I, you know, I'm a little skeptical of that. So I'm probably in that continuum. I'm, I'm closer to Aristotle and some of the other Christian authors like Augustine and John Chrysostom. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas than I am to Nussbaum or to the Stoics, but I'm also not coinciding with, with Aristotle. I can see that the Stoics are on point. And I do think that, you know, it, we need to distinguish between like having an overarching assessment of anger and then the individual bits of the analysis. And so I think that Nussbaum has some stuff that's quite useful I think that all the other authors that we're reading do as well. So, um, all right. Nora says, would you have any recommendations for work similar to Lord's essay? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have a great recommendation, which is a direct response to Nussbaum by a, um, another author who's not as well known, but, probably deserves to be, and that is, uh, I may be mispronouncing her name, Maisha Cherry. Um, she has a, a great short little book called The Case for Rage, and she is advocating Lordian anger um, and saying that it could be useful for trying to um, work towards, not as a sole uh, uh, resource to rely upon, but it could be useful to work for justice within society. So yeah, there's, there's other people out there. Um, Ken says very easy for anger to become brutality and revenge when applied to theories of justice. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I would, I would qualify that and say, you're right. It is very easy for anger to be translated into brutality or cruelty to use another term that Seneca uses and revenge, um, within the framework of either theories or advocacy or working for justice. And the problem with that is that you get a lot of people who are either, um, not particularly nuanced in their approach. And they think that if anger is okay in some circumstances, it's okay basically across the board, or at least it's okay for their side, right? So if you take Aristotle as a, a prime example of somebody who thinks that there is a legitimate role for anger, Aristotle would say, you really need to be suspicious of your own anger and you have to keep it within check. It can't be running the show and you can't just say, well, I'm, I'm justified. So I get to, to be as angry as I like. That's a vicious person who, uh, or, and, and, uh, self lack of self-controlled person who, who does that sort of thing. And I think that, that, you know, this all or nothing thing that a lot of people have in our society or various forms of tribalism, 
um, you know, do tend to promote that. They give people a pass. They say, well, you've been wronged, so therefore you get to be as mean as you want. No, no, no. That's that's not the way any of these thinkers would go. And, and a lot of them would say, like even Aristotle, what's a mild disposition with respect to anger? Prone to forgiveness, you know? So, um Green thumbs, do you think Aristotle would consider the biblical story of Jesus ousting the merchants from the temple to be an example of virtuous anger? Well, so in order for it to be virtuous, you need to know the person's character. It's not just the act itself, right? For Aristotle, an action can be in accordance with virtue without being virtuous. So we want to be, you know, careful with how we use that term, virtuous. Um, I mean, yeah, probably Aristotle would be cool with that if it was properly explained to him what the hell was going on because Aristotle and, uh, you know, the, the landscape, the moral landscape having to do with the temple and stuff like that. It's not like an immediate, it's not like Aristotle would look at that and be like, oh, I, ex I know exactly what's going on there. It would take a little bit of explaining for, for him, right? Similarly, if you were to bring him into our own time, there's a lot of our own practices and institutions that would seem rather weird to him, but then he could, he could come to understand it. So yeah. And one of the topics that we do discuss in the class is, you know, with this Jesus guy, um, does he get angry or not? I mean, the word orge is used in at least one place in the gospels. And there are actions like the, you know, cleansing or scourging of the temple, depending on how you want to think about it, that, you know, it seems like an angry action, right? Um, so, yeah, we, we we definitely talk about that. We also talk about something else. If there aren't any any other questions, I'll bring up this, what might, might seem a little trivial. So in the Sermon on the Mount, in, you know, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has these... Um, three things that he says about, about the anger. And it's in the context of saying, I'm not here to take away or destroy the law. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm here to fulfill it. Here's the thing about adultery. You know, the law says don't commit adultery. I say, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you're, you're committing adultery in your heart. And then it shifts to anger. It says, you know, the law says you shall not murder. But here's what I got to say. He who um, is angry with his brother it will be liable to the judgment. Now, I pause there because in a lot of the manuscripts, he who is angry with his brother without cause. Um, there were different variant texts floating around of the Gospel of Matthew. And... Um, People like John Cassian and John Chrysostom and Augustine, they know about this, right? And they go different ways. Like John Cassian is like, hey, I don't care if it says without cause, forget that. You know, the, the real text is he who becomes angry with his brother is liable to the judgment. Uh, Augustine is like, so what does this uh, without cause mean? And so it's, it's the same thing with, with John uh uh, Chrysostom, they're like, well, you know, we're going to get angry, but we want to not get angry for trivial reasons or in stupid ways or, you know, we, anger could have some some useful role, but what what is that useful role? And so they, you know, they devote a good bit of discussion to that. Um, not really an issue for Thomas Aquinas because he's got a whole different shtick where anger has to do with the difficult good um, you know, so now here's an interesting question from BG. Does Kierkegaard address the concept of anger in the crowd is untruth? I don't remember anger being discussed there. The anger of the individual versus the anger of the crowd. No, I don't, I don't remember anything like that. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell. Um, I'd have to go back and take a look at it. I mean, the other thing to to think about where this would be kind of interesting would be the present age as well, right? The, the present age is an age of reflection, not of passion. Well, anger is a passion, 
uh, you know, and the present age comes from this this review called the two ages, right? Um, you know, I would have to go through. Kierkegaard does talk about anger from time to time, but I don't remember him ever really having an analysis of it as such. But I might just, you know, not be remembering from texts that I haven't taken a look at for a long time. So, you know, there, there are lots of other people who we could have talked about in this class. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you only get um, 14 weeks. And then, you know, a finals week. So you, you just can't pack that much stuff into, into a semester. And again, this is why it would be cool to do something like a series again, Understanding Anger, or um, to do some, some online classes about it. You know, I think that would be kind of cool. Um, it is a topic that comes up quite a bit in, in my philosophical counseling work. Uh, because there's a lot of people who suffer from anger problems and have to have to deal with it. And a lot of the thorniest anger problems are, you know, how do you deal with your anger that is genuinely legitimate from, from you know, uh, what Nussbaum calls, you know, well-founded anger, right? It can be understandable that you're angry and yet, because, you know, some real injustice, some real harm took place, and yet it could be bad for you to get angry or to act out of the anger or to be motivated primarily by the anger. Anger is a, a really, really complicated emotion. Um, you know, it's really quite interesting that in um, Aristotle's work, anger is the most complicated of the passions or emotions you know you look at the definition of it it's got all these different moving parts um, thomas aquinas agrees about that in in platonic philosophy you've got this aspect of the human soul that's called thumos you know and it's important it plays some some key roles but it also can really really get you into trouble you know um, it's it's something that all these people have to uh Think about and and what's amazing is you know like when we teach philosophy classes we typically don't talk about this stuff but so many thinkers have something cool or interesting or intelligent to say about anger because it's been such a big problem throughout uh, the ages you know all right so uh, Caleb says I'm a student at a university in Boston I've been fascinated with philosophy and watched and listened and read content as much as possible for years. Well, that's good. Yeah. So um, at a university in Boston, oh, here we go. So how would you recommend going about discussing philosophical topics uh, with my peers and professors who don't know of my fascination? Well, um, in a place like Boston, you can probably find some philosophy meetups and clubs and stuff like that, probably even in your university. And what's cool about a place like Boston is, you know, let's say you don't go to Boston College, but you go to, you know, UMass or something like that. There's nothing that says that you can't, like, look up clubs at Boston College or vice versa, right? So you might want to look for the people that are engaging in discussions. And, uh, you know, you should probably see what the philosophy department and other similar related departments on your university campus look like, you know, um, whether they're having events that you can go to. Usually there's like talks and events and things like that, that they'll, they're not going to like say, oh, you can't come in here. You're not a philosophy major. So that, that could be good. Um, so philosophy topics with professors that don't know of your fascination, that's what office hours are for, you know? And you, I would do it with a light touch. You go in and you're like, hey, uh, you know, I'm interested in philosophy. Are you interested in, in this stuff? What can we do, you know, to talk about this stuff together? Office hours, this is a little bit of a side topic. 
students usually don't take advantage of office hours and professors are required to keep them. So that's when you go in and talk with them, right? That's, that's uh, when you can do your one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, as far as your, your fellow students or peers, um, you know, there's probably some that are interested in philosophy, but they're, they're not necessarily interested in exactly the same topics that you are. So you got to have kind of a bit of uh, willingness to stretch, you could say. As a matter of fact, that reminds me, I need to get in touch with this uh, former student of mine who's still down at Carthage College. I think graduating this semester, who who wanted me to bring down bring me down to talk to their philosophy club sometime this uh, this spring. Uh, we'll have to figure out a good day and time and schedule for that. Um, it's a good reminder. So, all right. Any other? Oh, well, we're already like forty minutes in. Um, quite a lot of stuff uh, that we've we've covered. Any other questions or comments that people have about this class, anger, philosophy? I don't really have a lot of other um, material to talk about um, other than, you know, this will probably be something that I try to bring to Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. I actually did um, propose a class on this a while back, but not not with exactly the same orientation, uh, and it, it didn't get into the hopper, but we can see in the future. Uh, Jason, is there a philosophy that covers music? Yeah, I suppose there's probably like a whole area called philosophy of music. Um, Plato and Aristotle talk about the different, you know, musical modes in, um, you know, in the uh, Republic and in the politics. So there's definitely people that are discussing music throughout the ages. Um, I don't know, because I don't specialize in this sort of thing, what, you know, philosophy of music in the present looks like. I'm sure there's probably lots and lots of stuff if you just Google it, you know. Um, and, and there's plenty of application for using philosophy in relation to topics that come up in music. So, you know, for example, one of the things that Scott Terulli and I have talked about quite a bit is, you know, metaphysical identity. When does a band cease being that band? You know, can you have a band that has no original members in it, for example? You know, so, yeah. All right, Kolomus says, is there any differences in how anger is understood between cultures you found when reading different philosophers um, that you found interesting? Same for similarities you found interesting between philosophers from different backgrounds. So yes and no. Um, first, it's very important to, to realize that there are massive differences within cultures. So you don't, you don't have to necessarily start looking to, you know, exotic cultures that we're not a part of or anything like that. Even in ancient uh, Greece and Rome and even in the modern period, people are all over the map when it comes to anger. Some people are like zero tolerance. Some people are like, hey, man, get as angry as you want. And there's everything in between. Um, but yeah, there, there, are, there are some differences that get brought up by authors for example, Nussbaum likes, as so do a lot of other people in a rather uncritical way, they love to bring up this ethnographical study, never in anger about these peoples that, you know, are, are teaching their, their kids. It's, you know, it's a small um, ethnic community uh, that anger is always bad and stuff like that. But th those are such outliers. Most cultures have like a fairly wide range of expressions and actions that have to do with, with anger. And it plays a role in much of, you know, literature. And so this is, it's not the same that it's exactly the same in every culture, but it's pretty um, consistent, you know, in a lot of, a lot of things. All right. So not quite sure what uh, Milahan is doing. There's a cup of coffee there. Um, 
maybe that's supposed to be this. So, all right. Any other questions, comments, matters people want to bring up? Uh, you know, while people are thinking about it, I'll say this. This entire weekend is basically going to be consumed with um, uh, building these classes out and maybe shooting a few videos and uh, um, working on some podcast stuff and, you know, cleaning up this place a little bit. So, uh, Milahan, um, what do you think about Heidegger? You got to be a little bit more specific. What do you think about Heidegger? There's like a million things you could say thinking about Heidegger. What are what are you particularly interested in? Um, I mean, I know that Heidegger exists. He's an important philosopher. What 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 in particular are you looking for? Yeah. So. Milahan says, I went to Barnes and Noble shop, bookshop and their philosophy section was terrible. Yeah, I mean, why would you expect it to be otherwise? It's a commercial bookstore, you know. Um, you're not going to find a great philosophy section there anymore that you would have at any of the other great chains that have disappeared like Walden Books. You go to something like a, you know, a university bookstore or a good used bookstore or something like, like that. Um, and then you'll, you'll find good philosophy sections, but you know, you don't expect that from Barnes and Noble. Uh, Milhan says, do you favor Heidegger's views on beingness or the human condition? I mean, parts of them. Sure. I mean, I, there's no such thing as beingness, but Heidegger does certainly devote a lot of discussion to being and, uh, Green Thumb, do you have any recommendations for contemporary writings on philosophy of science? I do not. It's not an area that I work in. Um, I work in quite a few areas, but I don't work in philosophy of science. And I even, you know, I, I had to study some of it for my graduate level examinations, but it was all the classical stuff. It's not contemporary stuff. As a matter of fact, there's so much stuff, can, you know, that's being written right now in every single field that asking for contemporary um, writings on something, unless somebody's like actually working in that field, you're, you're, you're not going to get too many of them. Uh, Miroslav, is there anything you would recommend to read before being in nothingness or jump into it? So that's Sartre's being in nothingness. Yeah, I mean, I would read some of Sartre's uh, shorter pieces, like Existentialism is a Humanism. Um, I would, you know... I mean, could it be helpful to read uh, some Heidegger, some some uh, Husserl? Yeah, but you don't need too much to make sense out of what Sartre is saying, or Hegel or Bergson for that matter. Um, I mean, it's a tough work in part because he is using a technical vocabulary, but I kind of think that the ideas are not like super complicated. And one thing that's really good about Sartre is he loves examples and he's quite good at unpacking them. So that makes the work a lot easier. All right, uh, Danny Walters, I've recently come across your channel and studied philosophy sporadically throughout my politics degree, but want to learn more. Where should I start on your channel? There is nowhere you should start. You'd start wherever the hell you want to. You know, it's like a smorgasbord. You walk in, you take the stuff off the buffet that looks interesting to you. And then, you know, if that's not to your liking, you can you know, go elsewhere to another restaurant or you can go and, you know, get another plate and try some other stuff. There's, there's no one place that you should start. You know, it, it's, it doesn't work that way. Um, Milahan, I've been reading Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It's very witty. Yeah, true. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, I kind of like when we get translations that aren't full of these and thous and stuff like that because my students get confused reading it. But um, Patrick says, should we only be asking about specific topics here? I got in late and it's not clear to me. Well, I give priority to stuff that has to do with the class that, you know, the um, session is about, which has to do with anger and justice. But you notice other people asking other things as well. Um, BG, anger within the confines of sport is somewhat interesting. Yeah, Nussbaum does have a little bit of discussion of that. Ian, 
um, her section, you know, it's one of the things she does in her book. She, she talks, you know, general stuff about anger and forgiveness. And then she begins with these, these levels, right? So you got the, the, well, let's call it the intimate personal level. And then there's this middle realm that she calls it. And then there's the realm of the political, social and all that. And so sports would be in this, this middle level for the, the most part. Um, Milahan, I wish Marcus Aurelius had more books. I mean, we're lucky we have what he has because he didn't write it for you. He wrote it for himself. It's literally called to, to myself, you know, so. All right. Uh, Caleb, I found your series on Lev Shestov is one of my favorite. It's crazy to me that he and his ideas are not as prominent. Do you have anything to say on Shestov? Uh, yeah, I, I like Shestov quite a lot. Um, it's not surprising at all that his ideas are not all that prominent. He had one major student, and that guy unfortunately died in the concentration camps, Benjamin Fondan. And uh, Shestov, like so many other great thinkers, just isn't that read by that many people because they're not quite sure what to do with them. I mean, Nikolai Malbranche is worth reading, right? But who reads him? You know, um, Alcuin of York is worth reading, but not too many people that aren't medievalists read him. Uh, it's just kind of a common thing, you know? All right. Um, Salovan, uh, as I am Russian, this might be interesting to me. Have you ever found yourself interested in Russian philosophical tradition if a one never took place as something unified? Well, there isn't a unified Russian philosophical tradition any more than there is a unified American philosophical tradition or British or, you know, any other thing. Um, there's lots of interesting Russian philosophers and um, writers and, you know, some quite, you know, think about Dostoevsky, who weaves a lot of philosophy into his work. Um, I think that one of the things that kind of stands in the way sometimes is translation, which can be, you know, a problem, right? And getting things out there. Um, but it's also a very crowded landscape. Uh, pipeline, I really appreciate your smorgasbord approach. It's anti-posing, welcoming and inviting instead of scaring people away. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, uh, people should read what the hell they want to read. I've, you know, I've talked about this elsewhere. If if your professor, you know, or some, you, you know, pundit out there is saying you must read these and these and these and these and not read these because those, those would be bad for you. They're probably full of shit. I mean, where you should be skeptical of these people. Where where did they get their ideas from? You know, um, it's a free country, as we say, right? Amilahan Philosophical's Corner. I think anger in wartime is very useful for survival. Um, no, that's not what military experts say. As a matter of fact, um, that'll often get you killed and make you engage in stupid things. And this was an issue back in ancient times. Seneca talks about this in On Anger himself about, you know, troops that get riled up and then make stupid decisions and get themselves killed and captured and, you know, fail in their objectives. Uh, Meshuganher, have you seen the recent Batman movie? No, I haven't. Um, I, I don't really watch superhero movies. Uh, you know, not because I'm totally against them, but I think that the most recent crops of them have been kind of garbage, you know, and I don't really like the fandoms around it either, you know. Um, so I don't I don't typically watch superhero stuff. And, you know, as a kid, um, I, I did like quite a few superheroes and Batman was one of them. Um but now not, not quite so much, you know, unfortunately. It can be interesting to think about in terms of anger, though, right? Uh, BG, I remember you referencing the Selma marches and how expressions of anger would be heavily frowned upon. Yeah, you know, and that's something that we do discuss towards the, the end of the book. Um, Martin Luther King and his organization actually would um, – do exercises to try to, you know, weed out the hotheads because they didn't want people, you know, creating more conflict and, and creating 
the possibility for greater crackdowns and stuff like that. So, yeah. All right. Well, we got about another five minutes. Um, then I got to get back to other work, but it's been nice uh, chatting with everybody. I'll do more of these. I haven't done these pop-ups for quite a while, but maybe it'd be a good thing for me to start doing again. Um, I used to do them and I would give my Patreon supporters like uh, a day or two of lead time before I was going to do them and, um, you know, sort of like a perk for them. And then uh, everybody else would find out that the day of. So, but it took a little bit of scheduling to make that happen. And then it just kind of fell by the wayside. I think because I was doing other streaming stuff like the Stoic Saturdays where I was like doing the, um, you know, walking through the virtues or I was doing readings from my book. Uh, oh, here we go. So Muhammad says, do you agree with Maisha Cherry that anger is essential for anti-racist struggle? So that is the key term, essential. And if you put it that way, no, I don't agree that it's essential. But I do think that it can be harnessed, and I do think that it can be useful. So, you know, that's a good distinction to, to make and to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, you also want to think about, well, anger in what way? Do you want, you know, like we're talking about, do you want hotheads who are, like, getting in the, the face of the cops and, like, you know, going going wild and then provoking a, a response, which then affects everybody? Or, uh, you know, do you want people thinking that anger authorizes them to do whatever they want? Or do they, you have to keep it within certain kinds of um, constraints? Uh, Patrick, do you have any book recommendations as an introduction to meta ethics? Do you have any videos about meta ethics? Sure, I have tons of them. You just got to like look through. They're not going to be labeled meta ethics because, frankly, meta ethics is bullshit. There is no such thing as meta ethics any any more than there is meta language. Meta language is language. Meta ethics is ethics. You just put a meta onto it. You know, when you look at the uh, substantive ethics that meta ethics is supposed to be meta to, every tradition has like is doing meta ethics. You know what is John Stuart Mill doing in uh, utilitar uh, in utilitarianism? He is doing substantive ethics, and he's telling you how the other kinds of ethics out there really are either covert for forms of utilitarianism or they're failures. That's meta ethics, and meta ethical positions all boil down to ethics. You know, I don't know why people are so obsessed with with uh, that distinction. Um, Muhammad, what's the philosophical difference between anger and rage? There isn't a philosophical distinction. There's philosophical distinctions that people make and that are, you know, sort of connected to their particular philosophy. There is no one single philosophical uh, uh, distinction there. Uh, Meshuganer, anger seems to exhaust people quickly when used as a tool for communication. It does and it doesn't. It depends on the circumstances. A lot of these things, you can't make these vast generalizations and have them be true. Muhammad, when is anger virtuous and productive? It depends on whose theory you're looking at. Why not read some Aristotle on that, right? He, he gives you some pretty clear guidelines for that. Um, or you could read Thomas Aquinas or you could read Plato or stuff like that. Stephen Franklin, anger can bring your attention to an issue, but reason should guide your response. Yeah, so that's, that's you know, Nussbaum's idea of transition anger. You know, you leave the anger itself behind eventually. Aristotle could endorse that. Um, Seneca would say you could actually do without the anger. You're probably better off without it in that case. Um Patrick, brief thoughts on moral anti-realism. I don't have brief thoughts on moral anti-realism. I don't do isms for the most part. Isms to me are sort of shorthand for who knows what, you know. Um, I don't begin my thinking generally in those terms. I, I look at what particular philosophers have to say about things, and uh, I don't I don't start at that level of generality. So, all right. Um, 
We've got about a minute left. Any other last uh, minute questions, comments, stuff like that? Uh, my sugar nerd favorite, favorite Sadlerism. I don't know what a Sadlerism is, so I don't have any favorites of that. Um, Muhammad, what are the principles of Lordy and Rage? Why not get the, why not read the actual um, text? Uh, that's it's very short, you know, the uses of anger. And then you can read uh, Misha Cherry, Cherry's book, you know. Um, she's out there. She's very public in, in her, uh, her work. She's done lots and lots of interviews and written a lot. So she's easy enough to find. All right. So we'll wrap up here. And uh, I'll say have a good rest of the weekend to everybody. Some of you might be tuning in from... Uh, you know, much further east of here, and it could be nighttime for you, or maybe some of you are, you know, uh, further west, and it's just early afternoon, or perhaps even the morning for you. So I'll see all of you, uh, or some of you at least, <laughs> sometime down the, the line, and I will uh, talk to you later. Maybe I'll do some other stuff about this class down the line if something cool happens in class that gets me thinking I, I don't know now i actually got to get like get all the work done to get ready for for this class so i'll see you later